Deputy Owen Murphy. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Cairn. You're, you're very welcome back. Um, in your opening statement on, on paragraph 59, you talk about the ECB role in the guarantee decision. And you say that the position of the ECB was that no bank was to be allowed to fail. And we have this that this came from uh, Trichet through the Governor. But how would you regard that position of the ECB? Would you regard it as an order from the ECB or a threat? Well, obviously, they were. The ECB is the authority that looks after the stability of the euro. And they were saying if you're a member of this currency, the rule is all banks, you're not to allow any bank of systemic importance to fail because the contagion effect of that is something that may not be able to be handled. So, in other words, if you were if you're to allow that to happen then and not, that not abide by that, apart from dealing with the problems you're going to have to deal with, which in my opinion would have meant a run on all your banks, would have made no sense. But even if you allowed it to happen, then you, you, you'd be very hard to find a cooperative ECB in the future to fund your banking system with liquidity. But just to try and clarify that, is it an instruction that you have to follow, or is it advice? In practical terms, I think it's, if, you know what you're, if you know what's in your best national interest, it is, it is an advice you should listen to. It's not, it's not, it's not something you should discard. You wouldn't view it as the ECB acting outside of its mandate to provide that advice? No, because we were asking the question. Was there, see, we were asking the question of is there, is there any prospect of a European initiative coming here? Is there any prospect of the Euro, uh, the European level interjecting here to try and see if can we, we arrest the problem? And the problem was, as you know, probably people have all talked about it now, is that, you know, the, at the time of the design of the Euro in 1999, there isn't a EU competence. There wasn't an EU competence on the supervisory side at that point. There is, thankfully, now, and that's sort of a response to what's happened. But at the time, there wasn't. And so, I mean, did this conditionality then affect the decisions that were ultimately taken on the night and also into the future? Yeah, obviously, we had to take account of that. Yeah. We had to take that into account. Now, it didn't make it easier for us, but we had to take it into account. Ask, I mean, should you have made an effort to inform the ECB what you were doing once that decision was taken? Bearing in mind that I think the <coughs> excuse me, meeting started at about 6 p.m. in the evening in the knowledge that something would have to be found in terms of a solution. Should we you didn't, kept the channel yeah, open? Yeah, we didn't. Well, we, I, asked, I asked the, um, the member of the Governing Council, who was our own central bank governor, what is the, what's the EU position here? And that was the first things, one of the first things I asked. Actually. What's the EU dimension? And unfortunately, the, the EU dimension was, you're on your own. That was the EU dimension that night. Um, and at that stage, then, I said, right, well, if that's where we're at with them, we better concentrate on what it is we can do. Um, and, it's, you know, and I was conscious of the fact, by the way, that you know, we were a sovereign government. We had to make a decision, as we understood it, what was in our national interest. And I'm as good a European as the next person, but you know, at the end of the day, we had to make a decision ourselves. An obligation to inform the ECB of that decision once it was made. Well, once it was made, the ECB were informed probably early the next morning. I think my understanding is that Mr. Trichet said that they heard of the guarantee through the media. Well, I'm sorry if he wasn't wrong before seven in the morning, but he—they he, were certainly informed. I mean, they were informed um, as quickly as logistically possible. Maybe not as soon as he was. He, maybe we should have rung him at four o'clock in the morning. I don't know. But should you have kept a constant line open to the ECB through the course of the evening as you were debating different uh, possibilities that would have an impact on other banking systems in the eurozone? Well, you know, I don't know what other governments used to ring the ECB when they had a problem with their banking system. I don't know that Mr. Gordon Brown rings when he had a problem. We read rang the, the ECB uh, prior yeah. to the meeting. Yeah, but I think that. From our point of view, we had uh, got the, the view of the, of the ECB from the, the government, the member of the governor, or the member of the bank, bank uh, governing council. And we were concentrating on the survival of our own banking system at that stage. And in relation to the commission, Kevin Cardiff told us that the competition commissioner was said to be hopping mad about the guarantee. Um, was any attempt made the next day in relation to dealing with the commission? Uh, and their response to the guarantee. Yes, well, as I was saying, we, we had um, the Attorney General was very much um, seized with that question, um, both on the night and the next day. And um, 
we got together some expertise to help us to put the case uh, as to why we believe this was proportionate for the serious disturbance that had occurred, and that we were under whatever it is, Article 87.3, that we were um, within our rights to do this, given the magnitude of what was facing us, and that it was proportionate, and that we had, and we had some advices uh, that you know, charging a fee, having a time limit, and all of this would was helpful. There were other cases where the Germans had, had sought to protect or sought to guarantee a bank earlier, um, not immediately earlier, but I, I read documentation on it, where they weren't, they weren't able to uh, get the approval through because they hadn't put a time limit on it. So, we, and in fairness, we, we made the application and we, and, and we met any concerns they had. Take it forward then to the 12th of October 2008, which is the first ever meeting of the Eurozone heads of state. And Kevin Cardiff wrote in his long statement on page 77, um, it was also evident that some governments had provided background briefings to journalists denigrating the Irish decision and its lack of community spirit. Worse than that, some of those briefings appear to be deliberately seeking to question the validity and reliability of the guarantee. Why, in your view, would other Eurozone countries want to undermine the Irish guarantee? And how real was that threat? at that point in time? Well, I, I've read that, what, what he has, has said about that. Um, I, was, I was the person who represented the country at that meeting. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't an easy meeting for us, I suppose, because you know, we had to do what we had to do as others were doing their thing. And um, they were afraid, I suppose, that the effect this would have on their, on their flows. You know, would, would Ireland suddenly become uh, a location for, for funds to come to Ireland that would otherwise stay in country A, B or C or whatever it was. And I think that was an over-exaggerated uh, view anyway. We were simply trying to retrieve what we had lost. We were not trying to take anyone else's resources or treasury. You know, we were trying to get back into a, into a viable position ourselves from a liquidity point of view in terms of cash in the system. And we were a small part of the overall um, financial system in Europe anyway. So um, I, I, I hear what he has to say about that. He obviously observed that from some of his official contacts uh, in, other, in other jurisdictions. I don't think it was warranted, if that was their view. Um, I, I want to look then, if I may, at the, the Dáil debate immediately following the guarantee decision. Because in that debate, um, Michael Noonan asked if there was a solvency problem attached to the liquidity problem. And I think he was the only person who asked that. But Brian Lennon never answered the question. But did any of your cabinet colleagues ever ask that question? Well, I, I, I can't say that that um, before Michael Noonan raised it, that any of my, my people in my cabinet raised it. I can't say that for sure. I don't recall that. Uh, the course of the decision being made or immediately afterwards? Well, when the decision was made and we met on the Tuesday morning afterwards, we, Ms. Finance outlined the base of what had happened. And obviously it had, been a, had very dramatic effects and people were had been had been phoned about it early, you know, late late the previous night. Um, there was no um, dissension, and I shouldn't, you know, I know cabinets are confidential, but there was no. It, it was saying, okay, if that's we had to go that road, we had to go that road. Um, but the um, the question of solvency. I mean, we were. We were dependent on, on, on the advice we were given on the night. That's all I can say about it. Okay, well, can I just come back to that again? I want to come back to the um, volume, it's volume four, page seven in the uh, core booklets. And it's the January uh, financial stability issues scoping paper, which we discussed last week. You said earlier on uh, this morning, this was the longest liquidity squeeze since 1945. You said that about the September period. Nine months earlier, in this um, scoping paper, it said, if a period of illiquidity continues, it is likely that an illiquidity institution will move closer to insolvency. And nine months later, how long does that period have to be? We're in the longest period since 1945 before these solvency issues start to be questioned by... Uh, when you can provide sufficient eligible collateral to obtain liquidity assistance from your, cent from your European Central Bank, then you have you, you are demonstrating the ability to continue in this tightened liquidity situation. We'd reached the situation in relation to Anglo Irish Bank then, where that they had run out of cash. So now you're next. You're, you're down then to 
some, you're down then to, um, to let this illiquidity become an insolvency, let it go. Uh, what's the impact of that in your wider economy? It's devastating from the advice we're getting, okay? It is systemic. And by the way, there was a lot of debate in subsequent years about whether it was systemic or not. Patrick Honan makes it very clear it was systemic. He makes it clear that a guarantee was required. He has views as the, extension, the extensiveness of it, but he, he accepts this was required. So, you know, um, that's when you reach that point, you have to make th these decisions. And um, what I make the point earlier as well, Deputy Murphy, is that post Lehman's, post mid September, that trigger point meant that the liquidity problem that was being managed, being managed with difficulty, but being managed turns into a horse of different colour altogether. And, and that's a problem. Okay, and then just one final question, if I may, Chair. You talk about trusting the advice on the night, because that same scoping paper on page 16, this was written nine months previously to September, says that in a period of severe financial markets turmoil, it may be very difficult to determine the true worth of the bank's assets, including its net contingent, contingent assets. It is much more difficult for a central bank or a financial regulator to know whether the bank is just a liquid or has become insolvent, especially in the light of the incentives a bank may have to disguise its true state of health from a central bank or financial regulator. And earlier today, you said no one knew where anything was going. This was 1927 stuff. Yeah, I'm in talking, the about, crash. talking about the market for the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But market response. So this was severe financial market yeah. turmoil in, in one view. So why did you trust the banks? But also, why did you trust the regulator, given what this paper was telling you nine months previously, what, we, what it was warning you could happen. Yeah, well, I mean, it is true that in a, in a very turbulent market situation, it is difficult to know what's liquid and what's insolvent, maybe. That's the point that they're making. But the fact... I think the point yeah. in this part is that you can't trust the information necessarily that the regulator or the central bank will have okay. because the incentives on the parts of the banks to misrepresent their position. Okay, well, right. But it comes back to the point then. Now, first of all, I'm making it clear. We made the decision on the basis of the solvency of the system. That's, we made that decision. That was certified to us by the regulator, who's the statutory people who have that responsibility. Now, that's the first point. First, let me, let me say it. Just the point I made is that you can't necessarily trust that information. Okay, but know. listen, if you're not going to trust, you know, you've got to trust somebody in this situation, Deputy, and you've got to be able to say, you put it to your people, you put it to your governor, your central bank, you put it to your, your regulator. You, you know, you, you've got to say, where, what is your view on this at, as we speak? What do you think is the situation? And what's your basis for saying that? And they gave us the basis for saying that. Now, the point I'm making to you in return, and I accept these are difficult situations. If it's insolvent, what do you do with it? If you let it go, you're told, it's a disorderly wind up and you're in bigger trouble. If you nationalise it, you're taking on all the liabilities there and then anyway. So now you're taking on the losses. If you go with a temporary guarantee and a contingency and you hope that the liquidity thing will sort itself out, you may well end up in a situation where you might have to provide some recapitalisation down the line, but you'll have a shareholding for it in a, in a bank that's viable, or that bit of it that's viable. You're trying to, these are, you know, there is, and, and, I'm, and I know by, the, you know, the, the questions you're asking, you've obviously, you, you know, you, 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 you know what you're talking about as well. I'm, I'm trying to explain, you know, you can't, you've got to, what's, you can't kill everything with the one stone, do you know what I mean? You can't, you've got to say, what is the most important thing here as we, from where we stand? And the most important thing from where we stood was, if there isn't cash got into this system, pronto, now, immediately, if we don't get that in, this, this, whole, this whole thing can go wrong on you. And Final question, uh, Mr. Cairn. Why let it become a systemic risk? Because in March of 08, you had the governor of the central bank asking two uh, pillar banks to lend to another bank, and those banks said they would if that lending was guaranteed. You go forward to September, you have the exact same situation. Also, you're, you're, already, or you're also bringing in a system-wide guarantee for all the banks. It's now a system-wide problem. But an intervention could have been made or could have not in March with a particular institution to protect the rest of the system. Well, there was no recommendation from the authorities to, to, to intervene at that point. There was a situation that was arising in relation to the liquidity of that bank for reasons which I've given earlier to Senator O'Keefe. But the issue was, you know, there was no recommendation coming to us from our advisors that that is what you do in this situation. And, you know, you know 2020 is great now. 
It's great now. Um, but all I'm saying to you is that uh, we acted on the best advice that was available to us. Was there a mistake in analysis? Yes, there was. There was a mistake in analysis. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's, we now know that. But even whether it was mistaken or not, on that night, what do you do if, you're, if, if your system is running out of cash? That's the issue. And we have to address that problem. Because if we didn't address that problem, everything was at risk.